first teach myself English. That was many, many years ago,、uh, when I was still a rocket factory girl. Some of my colleagues laughed at my effort, calling me a toad, a toad who dreams to eat swan's meat. They said, "You're a factory, little factory worker. Why would you want to learn English for?" They had a fixed idea: a factory worker could or could not do. Luckily, I did not listen to them. I wanted to learn English because I saw it as a possible tool to get myself out of the factory. When I was 16, my mother just dragged me out of school and put me to work. That was 1980. Now you clever people can quickly work out how old I am precisely. <laughs> so, you know, my mother just this was not my choice. My mother just. Dragged me out of dragged me out of school. Becoming a factory worker was the likely fate to myself. I grew up with fact with workers and their children in the factory's residential compound in Nanjing. But somehow I had a grand plan for myself. I had dreamed of going to university and then become a journalist and writer. I had ever, I've had this dream ever since my teachers started reading my writing. As a good example to show show other students at my class, but my family was very poor. Now I enjoy telling my children the story of eating cicadas,、um, cicadas, yes, <laughs> and to satisfy our craving for meat, a luxury at that time. My brother and I used to go out on hot summer days to catch cicadas from the tree top, and then roast them. Over a small bonfire and mount them up, eating cicadas, the insect. Yes, cicad roasted cicadas actually tasty and crunchy, and、um, and this, is, this certainly provided us with lots of protein. I dare you try if you haven't. There's there's actually a serious message about、uh, the cicada story. You know the Chinese people have a reputation for loving to eat weird. Weird food. You have to understand that the Chinese cuisine is very much a famine cuisine. We have to learn to make good use of every part of an animal body. I think it's a common mistake to believe that in your culture the way you do things is normal. I think if you want to under- really understand China, you just have to think out of the box and look beyond what we eat. Now back to my story. Fishing cicadas was fun, but working for a rocket factory wasn't. No matter how fascinating it might sound, among other products, my factory produced intercontinental missiles that were capable of reaching North America. Don't worry, I was no nuclear scientist. I didn't have any top nuclear secret to to tell. <coughs> the job, <coughs> excuse me, the job I was assigned to was to test a pressure gauge. Very simple and repetitive. China now, you know, it's a lot freer. But back then, working for a regimental military factory, we had to endure so much control: no lipsticks, no high heel shoes, certainly no fishnet tights. <laughs> I, nothing was personal. I worked at the factory for ten years. I never got any promotion. For one important reason, my boss, my, my bosses. Thought I wear a perm. In fact, I was one of the few Chinese who got naturally curly hair. In those days, only people people with bourgeoisie outlook in life would wear a perm. So I didn't have the correct ideology. So therefore, I did not deserve a promotion, which sounds quite ridiculous. It's been very interesting for me to look how, as how China developed in recent times. Why tightly gripping to power? The authorities have also slowly. Grant the people with more personal freedom. Now people have have the right to choose. Can, they can choose where to live and how to live their lives. They can curl their hair. They can dye their hair. They can shave off their hair. That's your choice. So there's still a cage. There's still control. But、uh, the cage has grown so big. Most people even don't feel the limits. But back when I was growing up in the shadow of the rockets, things were very different. The factory provided lots of things: housing, bus houses, library, hospitals, cinemas—you name it. 
I went to kindergarten, the factory to kindergarten, and then went to schools run by the factory. Later on, as a factory worker, the factory confined and defined my life. Originally, I called my memoir "A Frog in a Well." That's our famous, a famous story by our ancient philosoph philosopher Zhuang Zi about this frog being trapped in the bottom of the well that cannot see the great world beyond but a patch of sky. For I worked for ten years. I just felt I was like a frog being trapped in the bottom of the factory well. So as an escape route, I decided to teach myself English, hoping to get a job as an interpreter with one of the foreign companies that was slowly setting up shops in Nanjing. Learning English back then was a lot more challenging task. To start with, I had to borrow a radio set. From my cousin, I followed an English learning program called New Concept English. Every night at 7:30, I would turn on the radio and glued my ears to it, which cracked open a new world in front of me. Once I started, I just fascinated by this language system, so different from our Chinese character. So I would sometimes find myself talking English in in the street as I was cycling. In the dark street of Nanjing, I thought I was speaking English. I'll tell you what I sound, my English sounded like: Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. <laughs> I just said Merry Christmas and Happy New Year with a touch of Chinese accent. <laughs> so, some of my colleagues thought I was strange or crazy. So they started calling me Toad, Toad dreaming. For swans meat, I think in many culture, people don't particularly like people who think or behave differently. Especially in China, where there's a strong tendency towards conformity, our traditional wisdom urged people do not stand out, do not show off.、Um, for example, a bird that flies out gets shot first. A nail sticks out gets hammered down. A pig getting fat should be afraid. <laughs> Individualism and sense of self has never been a strong part of a culture. I think, in some ways, the Chinese communists went even further in destroying the sense of self. We were told to love Chiang Mai. We were told to devote ourselves to, to the party and, and follow a prescribed follow a prescribed path. But slowly, things are changing. You know, by the time I gained the grand title of Toad. I just didn't care what others thought about me, because what I was learning wasn't just ABCs, but the whole culture package. So slowly, I dared to be different. I started wear short skirts. I still wear short skirts sometimes. I, I, one point, I had this strange, strange glass I could find in Nanjing, and without my parents knowing, I had boyfriends, always better educated men, who each showed me one or two things. Um, after my English improved, I began to translate English documentaries, few、um, American films from English to Chinese, and I began to listen to BBC and VOA, which broadcast news very different from our propaganda. I grew to be very political with our friends. We talk about politics all the time. What was China's future? Would the Western-style democracy answer to China? So by 1989, I organized the biggest demonstration among factory workers in support of the democratic movement led by students in Tiananmen, because I believed that an individual could indeed make a difference. So my memoir was very much a personal of, of, a, of my personal journey of both sexual and political awakening. Interesting, in that journey also reflects what China went through in the 80s. The 80s, for many of us, was the most fascinating era when sea changes started happening. Deng Xiaoping opened Deng Xiaoping's economic reforms, opened China's door, and transformed China way beyond the economic fields. And it was also time women started unbuttoning Chairman Mao's straight jacket and put on makeup and stylish clothes. One Western journalist famously joked, "After China's economic reforms, Chinese women suddenly got breasts." Because before all men and women were clad in mouse lumpy, lumpy jackets.